Praise God. Praise God. Good morning, Grace Point. Um, Scriptures say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us come into the house and worship him. Anybody excited to worship God this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is good. He is worthy of our praise. Amen. So let's worship him this morning. Hallelujah.
that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, God. That you're still moving. You're still making a way. You're still building your church. That you haven't stopped working. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are here. Moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. All oh, you are, waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. May not make sense where you are to sing that, but declare it. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. You are here turning lives. You are here turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Come on, let's take a left. Stop, you never stop. Oh, you always say. 
sitting on a beach somewhere but you are still working you are still moving you are still building your church you are still drawing men unto yourself God oh we serve a great God who still heals who still breaks chains hallelujah hallelujah even when I can't see it you work even when I can't feel it you're working you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop. Oh, even when I can, even when I can see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop. This old hymn this morning. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him out his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know the saints, the Lord. We sing, Jesus, Jesus, how I
thank you, Jesus. Come on, isn't it sweet to trust in him this morning? Isn't it sweet? Hallelujah, hallelujah. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies to all my fears are come. Come on, let's sing this part. about what he's done for you. Think about how he's made a way for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. Child of God. 
Come on, let's declare that together. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears this morning we're not outcasts but you welcome us into your kingdom and so the victory you have we share in it hallelujah hallelujah Oh, 
There's many mansions. You don't even have to win the lotto, okay? All you have to do is say, Jesus, thank you. You're my Lord. And you're in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a place for us. Hallelujah. God is good. What an awesome choir and worship team. I want to read something to you guys this morning. Encourage you. Psalm 107 verses 1 through 3 says, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy is everlasting. The redeemed of the Lord say shall say so do those whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered from the lands from the east and from the west from the north and from the south when i when i think of grace point i think about a bunch of lands of people that come here together god delivering us some of you guys probably didn't want to come in today you was you was like oh, i just want to stay home but you're here and god's blessed you it's blessed to be here Let's give God praise. I'm going to pray. Father, Lord, we want to say thank you, God, for your mercy and for your goodness. So, God, God, you redeemed us, Lord. We didn't deserve it, but you redeemed us, so, God. Set us free from a bunch of sin. Shattered the hands of the enemy. Fixed our families. And reconciled us to you, God. Thank you. Lord, we love you, we worship you, we give you all the praise and all the glory today. Father, we just thank you for who you are, God. The God who sees and cares. Nothing too small, too big. For our King. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys may greet one another, love one each other. Give someone just a, a high five. Amen.
it up, James. I'm blessed. Blessed. That's James. God bless you. God bless you. There you go. Amen. Amen. So, guys, we could continue. Uh, we're going to continue giving God glory and praise in the giving of our tithes. You know, I, I've always said this. Tithing is really not an issue about uh, how much money we're giving to God. God doesn't need our money. It's really an issue of the heart. And you want to know if you have a healthy heart? It's when you're able to give. When you're able to give, you have a healthy heart. You have a strong heart. and allows you to get through life. So um, we're going to invite the ushers to come back, to come up. And there's three ways you can give. You can give in the bucket. Um, you can give online at Grace Point NY. It's on the website. Okay, gracepointny.org slash give. I was trying to get good at that. And then text Grace Point GF to 77977. Uh, that's my preferred way. It's the best way. It's easy. So, guys, um, we're going to pray and then we're going we're gonna to give. Lord, we just want to say thank you, Lord, for always providing, meeting our needs, Father. Father, we thank you that you're so good, Lord. There's nothing you don't see, Lord. There's nothing that we don't, we, we lack here, God. Lord, your word promises that the righteous won't lack for anything, God. We won't be begging for bread. So, Father, I pray, Lord, as we trust you, as we say, God, we're giving today because we trust you, Lord, that you will show up and show out in our lives, Father. Not because we're expecting, but because we trust that that's the God you are. And so, Father, we thank you. We say, Lord, stretch our funds, stretch these funds even for the church, for the body, for the local community, oh God. All around, Lord, use these funds for your glory, for your kingdom. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You to worship me. The splendor of the King. Clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. Wanna see how great? How great is our God? Sing with me.
thank you for your greatness God we thank you God that we don't have to come perfect we don't come, have to come with everything all together we can come as we are because you are already great you are already perfect and so in your perfectness and in your greatness God we have everything we need and so we stand on that God and we thank you for that we love you God we pray that you would just continue to walk among us and touch us God as the service continues Lord we love you in your precious and holy son's name. Amen. Praise God. Well, if you can, please be seated and turn your attention to the screens for the announcements. God bless you all, and welcome to Grace Point, where it's our desire for you to encounter God, serve the world, and grow in community. My name is Floyd Nicholson. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the church. We are very happy to have you all joining us today. Is this your first time in the building? We would very much like to connect with you after the service. I will be in the lobby right outside of our welcome room. We have a special gift just for you. I would also love to pray with you and answer any questions that you might have about the church. If you don't have a church that you call home, I'd like to invite you to be a part of what the Lord is doing right here at Grace Point. If today is your first time watching online, we would love to connect with you as well. Please text the word WELCOME to 845-210-9911. We also ask that you give the video a like, a thumbs up, and a share. It's never been easier to spread the Word of God. All you have to do is press a few buttons. How many of you ever visited the Holy Land? If you believe that Jesus has a plan for your life and you desire fellowship with other women of God, then sign up for this conference. You can do so by visiting the events page on our website. Every fifth Sunday here at Grace Point, we receive a special benevolent offering in order to help people who are experiencing a difficult time financially. This began many years ago when Al Ambrosino had the idea of meeting the urgent needs of people in the congregation. We gathered information, printed a stewardship handbook to guide us in how we could assist emergency needs. We also have an application process that guides us as to what is possible for us to do. We're not able to be an ongoing support, but for emergencies, we have been able to help people with unexpected expenses. In a few minutes, the ushers will come.
Amen. Praise God. Well, as the ushers come to receive your benevolence offering, let me pray for that and pray for the word today. We have an opportunity to give, uh, to be the church to each other. Amen. To those that are in need. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for what you're doing in each one of our lives. We thank you, Lord, for this community of faith. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to walk this journey alone, but that there are brothers and sisters that surround us. And so we thank you for this benevolence offering right now, Lord, as we give, Lord God, we trust that you desire to use us to help our brothers and sisters, Lord, to make it through those difficult times. And so we thank you that we can be the church to each other. Lord, we thank you for your word today as we dig into the book of Acts again. Lord, we just pray that you would speak to us. Heavenly Father, as we approach your word, Lord God, we do it reverently, but we also do it expectantly, Lord God, believing that you desire to speak to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give in that benevolence offering. We only do this on the fifth Sunday, but can I just say it's just a way to bless uh, those that are walking through uh, difficult times. Uh, Before we jump into the message today, I want to share with you, okay, an opportunity to serve And uh, it's a place where we have a continuing need as as we grow as a church. And first of all, let me say thank you to all of you that serve on a Sunday morning. Uh, If you just walk through the doors today and you came into the service, we're glad you're here. But I want to tell you there's a lot of things taking place before you even got here this morning. From the worship team to the choir being here to our ushers to our greeters uh, to children's ministry, all these areas... And so thank you for serving, because when you serve, you enable the church to be built up. Amen? Not the building. We are the church, right? And we want to build one another up. And so as we gather, we recognize this, that we want this, uh, this, church, this, this place we gather. Okay, this is not the church. We're the church. But this building that we gather uh, to be a, a safe space. No, let me rephrase that. A, a secure place, okay? Um, And so because of that, I don't know if you notice it, but we have a security team, okay? We have uh, men and women that are really the eyes and ears that are watching what's taking place here and uh, making sure uh, that they keep watch on what's happening. And and here's the reality. Regardless of what's happening in the world around us, as crazy as it may get, we never want to give up meeting together like this, okay? And at the same time, we realize there's some precautions we should take. Uh, in this day and age, okay? In the book of Nehemiah, you know the story. They're rebuilding the wall, and they're building the wall with one hand, and they have a sword in the other hand, right? Um, And so I was reminded of that this week. They're doing the work of the Lord, but they're also ready for any attack that would come their way. And we want to be that way as a church, okay? We want to be about the work of the Lord, but we also want to be mindful, and we want to be ready, amen? And so we need a few good men and women, Okay, we're not going to give you a sword, okay, but we need your help, okay, to help stand watch over this place. We'll train you, uh, we'll show you what needs to be done, but we really need more individuals with a heart to serve in that way. Yes, men and women, okay, because how many of you know women see things that sometimes we don't see? They, <laughs> women tend to see everything. Sometimes I wish they didn't, but they tend to see everything, right? And so we need men and women that are mindful. Uh, if you can help in that way, I want you to see John Fisher, who heads up our security department. He's going to be out there uh, in the lobby right after church, uh, right after service, and, and you can talk to him. If you've got questions, go to him. Ask. Uh, we want to help get you plugged in. Um, we have a need, but I'm convinced the answer is in the house. Amen? Answers in the house. Amen? You might be that answer, okay? Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, uh, the church is on the launching pad, okay? The gospel is on the move, and and this is really where uh, foreign missions gets its birth, with the first missionaries being sent out by the church. And and what started in the hearts of of just a few people is about to be sent to the far reaches of the world, and that's what Jesus wanted, right? Uh, Again, Acts 1-8, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to what? And to the end of the earth. If I could give you a very broad outline of the book of Acts, you write this down. Here's the very broad one, okay? Chapters 1 through 7, the gospel fills the city of Jerusalem. Chapters 8 through 12, it goes to Judea and Samaria. And beginning in chapter 13, this is where we begin to see the gospel message go to the whole earth, okay? And and as we read the book of Acts, understand... This is our handbook, okay? This is our example. We have a mandate as the church of God to get the gospel message out there, amen? 
It's why we support missions the way we do. God wants Christians to be involved in missions. And so you can pray, uh, you can give, you can go. I hope you do all three, all right? Would you stand with me one more time? We're going to stand for the reading of the Word. We're just going to reverence the Word of God in this way. Acts chapter 13 says this. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said this, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that's what his name meant, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, he looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated today. We're going to dig into this text. And uh, it's a text that begins with a number of names. You see them there? We're familiar with Barnabas. We know this son of encouragement. We're familiar with Saul. But we see some new names there, okay? Simeon, it's the same name as Simon. He was called Niger, which means black, okay? So it's likely that he was dark-skinned, okay? There's Lucius from Cyrene, which is located in modern-day Libya. So he's from North Africa. And then there's Menaean. Who, who it says this, interesting thing, he was a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch. Think about that for a moment. Herod the Tetrarch is also known as Herod Antipas, okay? He was the one who had Jesus stand before him, and he turns him right back over to Pilate before his crucifixion. Herod Antipas is the one who beheaded John the Baptist. Now, think about this. Menaean and Herod Antipas are brought up together. Their families are both well off. They must be, right? And so they play together as kids. They're on the playground together, right? They're enjoying this time together. But they make drastically different choices that lead to different directions. One turns into this evil king, and the other becomes a leader in the church. Tells us a lot about the power of the choices we make, right? And where those choices can take us. But, but we see in these men, what's so interesting is this very diverse group. They're from different backgrounds and regions, but understand, in, in Christ they are one. Now, Ephesians 4.11 tells us that the church is made up of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, when I look at that verse in Ephesians, I think the Greek really tells us that pastors and teachers are the same calling, okay? You could use one word there. It's almost like shepherd teachers is what it's saying. But in the church in Antioch, we don't see the titles of apostle or evangelist, right? It says there were prophets and there were teachers, right? Now, Saul will refer to himself later on as an apostle, and he and Barnabas are about to go out and evangelize. They're going to certainly do the work of evangelism. But look at those two words, prophet and teacher. So what is, is a prophet? Right? You may hear of a, a prophetic ministry. Someone is called a prophet. Well, generally, prophets can predict things that are to come. But really, the word implies one who shares a message that is inspired by God for a particular people and for a particular time. Prophets can generally teach and preach, 
but, but di- the difference is their message is usually anointed with a timeliness, okay? And, and so we see here mentioned in our passage that there are prophets and teachers in Antioch, and that's exactly what the church in Antioch needed, okay? They needed uh, these men. And so these men that are listed, they, they seem to be spiritual overseers, elders, if you will, of the congregation, what we would call elders. And while they're worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit says this to them, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. It's here in this passage where we see how the elders of the early church function. They meet together to worship, and while they're fasting and while they're seeking the Lord's guidance for the church, in the midst of that worshiping and fasting, the Holy Spirit speaks to them. Now, the passage doesn't tell us how the Holy Spirit spoke, right? And I actually think that's a good thing, because if we read how the Holy Spirit spoke here, we might limit God to speaking in that one way all the time, right? We tend to do that. But I hope you know today that God speaks in many ways. He speaks in many ways to us. And so we don't know how the Holy Spirit spoke. Was it an audible voice? We don't know. But we know that the message was clear and the leadership of the church, right away they act on that message. Just imagine how healthy the church around the world would be if they followed the pattern set for us in Antioch, right? They they fast, they pray, God speaks and they respond, right? How, How simple is that? Understand there is there's always a need for prayer. There's always a a need in our lives to to seek the face of God It's one of the reasons we gather on Tuesday evenings. We come together. We we pray together We pray for one another and we seek God verse 3 Says then after fasting and praying They laid their hands on them and they sent them off. I, I love this They hear from the Lord and they act on it right away They act on what they hear, right? And and the Greek is very clear here. It literally reads this. After having fasted and after having prayed and after having laid their hands on them, they sent them out. Now, what would they have prayed for? Well, they certainly would have prayed for God's direction. They would have prayed for God's anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be upon these men. They would have asked the Lord to, to bring fruit out of their labor and that the Holy Spirit would just fill them with power to proclaim the word of God. And, and we're going to see those prayers fulfilled. And so they lay their hands on them. Now, if, if you've grown up in the church, you're familiar with the laying on of hands, right? And, and really, it is, it is symbolic when we lay hands on someone and we pray for them. It is symbolic that the hand of the Lord is on their lives, right? It, it's really a confirmation that the hand of the Lord uh, will bless them, bless their work. And so God is calling Barnabas and Saul to this particular work of ministry, and the church affirms it. This is how it always should be. There's God's calling, and there's God's confirmation, right? And then the church confirms that calling, and the church supports. Basically, they're sending their leaders out to do in other places what they did in Antioch. And and while there's excitement to send them out, I'm, I'm sure there's also sadness, right? I mean, Barnabas and Saul, these guys had invested into their lives for some time, and now they're leaving. They had poured into their lives. But as these two men are sent out, it would mean that other elders would have to pick up the slack. And, and, and I wonder how those other elders felt about that. I, I think they realized probably now it's our time to step up. It's our time to serve more diligently. But, but we see in this what God is doing on the earth. Remember last week, we, we talked about how Herod Agrippa seemed to have all the power, right? He seemed to have all the power when he killed the apostle James and then he had Peter in prison. But all it took was one touch from an angel and it was all over for King Agrippa. But here's this former Christian killer, right? Saul. He's together with Barnabas, this son of encouragement, who in the scheme of things, they were insignificant men. Many didn't even know their names. But when God laid his hand on them to anoint them, when God sent them out, the world would never be the same. You need to remember this, church, that things, as you look at the world around us, as you look at the the power structures that we see around us, that things are rarely what they appear to be at any given moment. And there are times when it, it looks like the world is winning. There are times when the conditions around us seem to be in favor of the world. But if we step back and we look a little deeper, we see that God is actually prevailing and will prevail in the end. Amen? Amen. I've read the end of the story. God wins, right? (laughs) He wins. And and so what's happening here in in Antioch is is so exciting because it's really the final step in the expansion of the church. This is really the beginning of the missionary movement of the church. 
Remember, up until this moment, the gospel spread because the church was scattered. It was really persecution that brought the gospel outside of Jerusalem. But now the church is becoming intentional, right? They're becoming intentional. How do we get this message to the whole world? Why? Because Jesus commanded it. And now they're motivated by the love of God, what God has done in their lives. And they say, we need every individual to come to a saving relationship in Jesus. We, we want everyone to be reconciled to God the Father. That, that's why we as a church have, have been so passionate through the years about seeing the Bible translated in so many languages of the world. When you talk about the Word of God, understand this today. No other book comes anywhere close to having as many translations as the Bible, right? And, and it's amazing to me because... When Barnabas and Saul go out, they really have no idea how big the world is. Like the, their view of the world is pretty limited, right? They, they have no idea that it would take over 2,000 years to complete this, missage, this mission. And again, the exciting thing is that the mission could be completed in our lifetime. In our lifetime. We, we could see the gospel go to those remaining uh, villages and places, uh, and, and that's something that we can do. And so understand, every time you pray for our missionaries, every time you give to our missionaries, every time you go on a missions trip, you are working to complete what the early church in Antioch started with Barnabas and Saul. And, and so the message from the Holy Spirit is this, send out Barnabas and Saul to the work that I have called them to. And really, the rest of the book of Acts is going to show us that that work is really this. It's planting new churches as they go. They're evangelizing from town to town. And when they evangelize, they establish a church. That's God's plan, the church. Amen? That that there would be a group of believers that would gather together. Now, look at verse 4. It says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So look at this, because... Verse 3 tells us what the church sent them out, right? But here in verse 4, it says they're being sent out by the Holy Spirit. That they're sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. And so which one is it? I say yes. It's both, right? The church sends them out because of the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so really it's the Holy Spirit that sends them out. When, when, when we talk about the work of ministry and missions, understand that there are some that are sent and there are some who just went. And, and sometimes people go where they're not sent. I mean, think about the church in Antioch. At this point, it's a, it's a fairly large church. But there are only two that are sent out by the Holy Spirit for this particular task. And then, of course, John Mark, who's Barnabas' cousin, he comes along to help. But understand that God sends those that he prepares. And, and we need to be careful not to let people send us where the Lord hasn't called us. When you read the statistics, it's sad that half of ministers, uh, half of ministers leave the ministry within the first five years. Right now, they say only one in ten actually retire as a minister. Now, there's a number of reasons for that, but I think one of the reasons is that there are those that have responded to the call of man rather than the call of the Holy Spirit, right? They've responded to the call of man rather than the Holy Spirit. And, and while missions work is difficult today, it's not as difficult as it was in those first years. It's not as difficult as it even was 100 years ago. You know, at the turn of the century, when missionaries would go out, they didn't pack a suitcase. They would usually pack their stuff in a coffin. They would. Because they, they, they never expected to return home, and, and many didn't. Many gave their lives for the gospel. Many missionaries died on the mission field because of disease or persecution or martyrdom. And, and 2 Corinthians chapter 11 is going to tell us all that Paul has to endure, right, before he's murdered. But here are Barnabas and Saul, and, and despite knowing how difficult things are going to be, they obey God, and they just trust God for fruit to come out of their lives. Can we do the same, I wonder? Can we trust God for fruit from our lives when we walk in obedience? And, and so they went to Seleucia, but Seleucia wasn't very far away, okay? It was the nearest port city to Antioch. It was only about 16 miles away. It doesn't tell us they did any ministry there. I, I think they're just going there to catch a boat. It's kind of like me saying, and they went to Newark Airport, right? That's, they're getting ready to catch a boat, okay? But when they arrived at, at that port city and they're, they're believing God has called them to go out, I wonder if there was some discussion about where to go, right? And then as they talk about it, Barnabas says, why don't we go to my home country? Why don't we go over to, to Cyprus? I, I got some contacts there. I got some people that need to hear this message. So let's go there. Now, this is a good way to start a missionary journey because Cyprus was to them what Hawaii is to us, okay? Cyprus has this beautiful climate. 
There's a very large Jewish population there, and it's only about a 75-mile journey by sea. And so verse 5 says, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. Now, I want you to see this because this is a pattern that we're going to see repeated throughout their ministry. They, They go to the synagogue first. They always go to the synagogue first. Now, why did Saul and and Barnabas do this? Well, they knew that the message is to the Jew first. They knew the message is to the Jew first. They're God's chosen people. They're the ones who were to proclaim the truth of God to the world. That was their mission in the Old Testament, but it's still true at this point. However, the message now included the fulfillment of prophecies in Jesus as the Messiah. We're going to see uh, Saul's sermon next week, actually the next two weeks, right? But, but there's, a, there's, a, there's a practical reason that they go to the synagogues first. Because in the synagogues, there's a starting point, right? Again, the Jewish people understood the nature of God from Scripture. They understood the, the sinful nature of man and, and God's demands. They knew God's attributes. They knew that he was holy and righteous, but also abounding in steadfast love. And the Jews knew that God would not leave sin unpunished. And so when a Jew recognized, yes, Jesus is that promised Messiah, when he accepted the salvation that was offered, that Jewish person would naturally be a part, a core part of the new church in that area. We also have in the synagogues what you call God-fearers. They're attending the synagogues, right? They were Gentiles who had a respect for the word of God, but maybe had not yet converted to Judaism. And some of these synagogue attenders would become elders later in the early church. And so the Jews, especially those who weren't ultra-religious, but those who just really loved God, would certainly be fertile ground for the message of the gospel. Now, I want you to notice something. Up until this point in our passage, Luke doesn't tell us about any results from this mission trip. Okay, there's no salvation stories. There's no stories of multitudes coming to Christ. They're going to synagogues across the island, but apparently they're not seeing much fruit. And that would have been hard to take, okay, especially for Barnabas and for Paul. They they had seen such a response in Antioch, but here they are, and they're going. And they're not seeing a response, but in verse 6, that's about to change. Verse 6, when they had gone through the whole island of Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul, and he sought to hear the word of the God. So they, they cross the whole island from the east to the west. It's about a 115-mile journey. They're walking on these Roman roads. And, and on the far side of, of the island, in Paphos, they meet some spiritual resistance. And, and here's the reality. Before we see real fruit, there's usually a spiritual battle, Okay. Before we see real fruit, there's usually a spiritual battle. And the battle here comes from a magician, a sorcerer. The proconsul, this this Roman uh, ruler, Sergius Paulus, had his own sorcerer, as many did. And and the name of this man was Bar-Jesus, which means son of Joshua or son of Jesus. Now, this is not how Paul's going to refer to him in just a moment, okay? (laughs) This man is, is a Jewish false prophet. And Hebrew law said that false prophets could be stoned. But somehow this man convinced, he convinced the the proconsul, this ruler, that he had prophetic powers, and so that's how he got his job. But Sergius Paulus hears about Barnabas and Saul. He hears that they're on the island and they're traveling to the synagogues and and they're bringing something new. They're bringing a, a message of salvation in this man, Jesus. And so he wanted to hear about it. Scripture says there he sought to hear the word of God. He's described as as a sensible man, but his magician, also called Elymas, must have had an evil spirit to have been able to try to deceive him. Look at verse 8 again. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, he opposed them. He opposed Saul and Barnabas, and he tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Now, why did this false prophet care if his boss heard the word of God? Why would he have been opposed to, to Barnabas and Saul sharing with him? Because he knew this. If he got saved, it might cost him his job, right? If he had an encounter with, with, with God, he, he might lose his job. But we need to see this, though, that this man was spiritual opposition to the gospel because the spirit in him hates the message of Barnabas and, and Paul. And, and that spirit doesn't want to lose its influence over this island. Understand, it's the same for us. When we declare the truth of the gospel, the spirit of this world hates the message of the gospel. 
And that spirit doesn't want to lose its influence. It doesn't want to lose its, its grip over an area or over a people. And so we need to understand, church, again, our battle's not against flesh and blood, right? It's against demons and principalities that are threatened by the power of the gospel of Jesus. Be- because we know this. When the gospel is preached, when people are set free, the enemy loses his power. Now, remember in the book of Acts, at the beginning, we saw opposition, and it came from the established religion, right? The opposition came from the Sanhedrin. And then the opposition comes from political power. It comes from Herod Agrippa, right? But now we're seeing a sorcerer who is inspired by the demonic realm. But we need to understand this, that all throughout all of that, all opposition to the gospel at its core is inspired by the enemy. John writes in 1 John five nineteen. he says, We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Listen to me. When we declare the gospel, understand Satan's not just going to sit there quietly. (laughs) I can say, go ahead, as as blind eyes are open, right? Uh, Ephesians 5.11, I was reading this verse last night. It says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather what? Expose them. Now, here's the reality. I think a lot of believers don't have a problem with that first part. Like, Pastor, I'm not going to take part in those things. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay away from that. I understand that's wrong. But here's the question. Do we expose them? Do we shed light on the devil's schemes? Because when you do, understand the enemy's not going to be happy. And, and so much has gone on in our world and in our nation. So much has transpired because the church has stayed silent. I think we valued being nice too much, right? Uh, Listen, when we talk about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, nice is not one of them, okay? Because love is, right? But love so often speaks the truth, even when people think we're not nice. There are things that are taking place right now around us, and I'm not even going to say in our world, but in our county. There are things that are taking place in, in our school districts that need to be exposed. And when you expose them, understand this, the enemy will attack with persecution, we need to be aware of this church, but we also need not fear, right? For greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. Amen? And so here they are. They're bringing the message of the gospel, and the enemy is not happy. Verse 9, but Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, you read that part, and you think, someone's filled with the Holy Spirit. They're only going to say nice things, right? I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. God bless you, Right? But he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And making that very clear, he looked intently at him. I wonder what that look looked like. I don't know if he was smiling. He was staring this guy down. And he said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all unrighteousness, you're full of all deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Understand, church, in our, ta- in our, in our lives, there's a time for gentleness and understanding. But I also believe there's a time for bold confrontation. And more and more in the world that we live in, we need to ask the Holy Spirit for discernment on how to respond. Because hear me, again, I think too many Christians just want to be known as nice. Oh, bless her heart. She's so nice. Bless his heart. He's so nice. But nice is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was never described as nice. He was described of being full of grace and truth, right? And he boldly confronted the lies of the enemy. He also turned over tables. He had a whip in his hands. That's not nice, right? And the problem is for us, I think if we're honest, we just want to be loved by everybody. But even Jesus was not loved by everyone. I mean, the things that he said ultimately got him killed. And in today's day and age, the moment you speak truth is the moment that they're going to say, well, you're not nice. Even if you speak that truth so gracefully, right? You get labeled right away. You're labeled as a fundamentalist. I got this one this week, Christo-fascist. I had to look it up. I was like, what is that? Talking with somebody about the issue of abortion. and We were discussing choice. What does choice mean, right? And they say, well, I'm pro-choice. Well, what is the choice? say it's the choice of whether or not to have a baby i said well if someone is pregnant they already have a baby and so what is the, what is the choice right the choice is whether i'm going to keep it or i'm going to kill that baby right let's be honest about what the choices we're, we're talking about right and so right away i'm christo fascist right i gotta have to look it up look it up but hear me we can't shy away from the truth because of the labels that the world puts on us right in this moment, I don't know how those that, that saw this responded, but they probably looked at 
at Saul and said, man, this guy's out of his mind, right? But Saul, who was also called Paul, this is where he gets his name changed. We're not told why it happens, but it's interesting that it's brought up when Paul is trying to share the message with a man named Paul, right? And so at birth, he was given his Hebrew name, the name Saul, like King Saul, because actually he was from the same tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, just like King Saul, Saul, okay? That's what his mom and dad would have called him, right? When they called him for dinner, Saul, come on, right? But nine days after his birth, he would have been given his Roman name, which is Paul. And the Roman name Paul, it actually means small. And so I can't help but think that maybe in the midst of such a demonstration of power, Paul needs to be reminded that he's not that great. He's actually very little compared to who God is. But Luke makes it clear here that Paul is filled with the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a reminder. He's still full of the Holy Spirit. He's not just some angry man looking to blow off some steam when he says, son of the devil. He's making it clear. Your name may be Bar-Jesus, but you're not a son of Jesus. You're a son of the devil. Understand, Lucifer is a deceiver, and that's what this man is doing. He's trying to deceive the proconsul. Jesus himself said that there would be weeds among the wheat, and those are actually sons, he says, of the evil one. Now, look at this description of this man. You enemy of all righteousness, you're full of all deceit and villainy. And I'm like, wow, Paul, why don't you tell us how you really feel, right? And then there's this question, right? Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of God? Understand, this is a question, but it's also an invitation, right? It it was John the Baptist's invitation to make a highway in our hearts for the Lord through repentance. Listen, as the kingdom of God has advanced through the years, it's always been met by threats and persecution. Now, some would say, oh, you Christians, you've got a persecution complex. I would say for good reason. (laughs) Because the data attributed to it puts the number of Christians that are martyred since the time of Jesus at 70 million. 70 million martyrs since the time of Jesus. The the number of Orthodox Christians murdered in Russia between 1917 and 1950, 15 million. In China, at least uh, 200,000 Christians and foreigners were killed in the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, Another 700,000 were killed in communist China between 1950 and 1980. The number of Catholics killed in Mexico from the 1800s to 1930 is estimated to be 107,000. While 300,000 Christians are believed to have been killed under Idi Amin in Uganda between 1971 and 79. The estimates of the number of Christians killed annually for their faith today, the the numbers differ greatly, but it's estimated to be about 100,000 a year. And so, yes, we have a persecution complex, I guess, right? But I know I've said this before. I want to say it again. We ought to expect persecution in our lives as we stand for the truth of the gospel. Listen, I'm not saying you have to go looking for it. (laughs) But chances are, if you live righteously, if you live your life for God, it's going to find you, right? And so how do we pray? How do we pray, especially for those that are on the front lines, right? On the front lines of the mission field. We need to pray that they would be full of the Holy Spirit. You see, that's the only way that Barnabas and Paul can face resistance like that. And it's the same for us. When we encounter resistance, we need to be in tune with the Holy Spirit's voice. And we need to ask, again, is this a time to respond with gentleness or with rebuke? And either way, we can do that in love. We can do that in love because understand, when rebuke is given in love, it's given with a hope that someone sees their heart and and, and sees the truth and that they would turn and that they would repent. Verse 11 says this, And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. This is Saul talking to this false prophet. He says, The hand of the Lord is upon you. It's interesting because at the beginning of this chapter, we read about them laying hands on Barnabas and Saul, and the hand of the Lord is on them right? The hand of the Lord is on them to bless them. But understand, the hand of the Lord can do different things. (laughs) The hand of the Lord is upon you. And he says, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. And immediately mist and darkness fell upon him. And he was, uh, went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Now, notice that Paul says the blindness is temporary. He says it's just going to be for a time. We saw Paul powerfully declare the gospel of Jesus Christ in Damascus, but man, we've never seen him like this. <laughs> and, and despite the fruit that comes from this encounter, we're never going to see him call down God's judgment in the same way. But Paul tells Elymas, the hand of the Lord is on you. Again, what a strange statement. 
Here's what you need to understand about the hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord can bless, but the hand of the Lord can also punish. And the hand of the Lord can also bring conviction. And, And what happens to this sorcerer is strangely similar to what happened to Saul at his conversion, right? Remember, he's on the road to Damascus. He's trying to stop the church from advancing, and he's blinded. Paul couldn't see for a time, and maybe he's speaking from experience. Here's what's going to happen to you, right? Because you are opposing the work of God. Remember last week, we saw Herod Agrippa's painful fate when he tried to kill the leaders of the church. And now we're seeing the fate of this sorcerer who's trying to stop the proconsul from hearing the word of the Lord. And, And here's the truth. The powerful still think they can stop the church by harming us. Even today, there are those who would come against the church to silence the gospel. But when they reach out to harm us, they only advance the church and they harm themselves. That's what happens every time. We we know this, that, that China's oppression of Christians has built one of the most powerful churches in the world right now. Islamic persecution has made for some sold out ministers of the gospel in some Arab nations of the world. Yes, his truth, his truth is still marching on. Verse 12 says, in the proconsul, what does it say? He believed. He saw this and, and he believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The, the sorcerer wanted to keep the proconsul from believing, but in the end, he ended up helping him believe, right? The judgment that came upon him actually convinced Sergius Paulus that the gospel was true. And, and I believe this. I believe that he repented. I believe that he was born again. I believe he received the truth of the gospel. And and so this missionary trip starts out slow, but now it's made its first big gain. It's interesting, when you look at the history of it, Sir William Ramsey, a great archaeologist, he reports this, that inscriptions bearing Sergius Paulus' name have been found on Cyprus. And, And those inscriptions actually confirmed that he was a Christian and that his entire family actually became Christians. Now, I know the skeptics of the Bible would say that Luke used historical settings and he just added miracles to them. But do you think someone who would write about deception being of Satan, that he would write a deceptive story, right? In in essence, he would be writing his own condemnation. Luke was doing here what he did from the very beginning. He's compiling an orderly account of what had taken place. And we see it backed up by archaeology. We see it backed up by other historical references of that time. Verse 13. As we close, it says this. Now, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, it it doesn't appear that Paul preached in the synagogues of Pamphylia. The next place he would preach was in Galatia. We see that in Galatians 4.13, that it's because of an illness that he first preaches to them. But John Mark leaves at this point. Later on, there, there's, there's, there's going to be some controversy over this, okay, over, over John Mark and whether he should be with them. Later on, Paul's going to imply that he didn't have the courage to endure. And in this passage right here, it just says he left. But later on, when Paul talks about it, it's almost like he deserted us, okay? Um, I don't know if, if John Mark didn't have the courage to endure what was ahead of him. We know John Mark's mother was probably very wealthy, and so he, he may not have been used to living under such hardships. And later on, Paul and Barnabas are going to go their separate ways over whether or not to take John Mark with them again. But, but I, what I love is that we see the redemption in the fact that Paul's later years, he asked John Mark to come and help him. He, he says in, in, in 2 Timothy 4.11, right, he's useful to me for the ministry, right? But here's what I want you to see as we close this passage today. It's this. That even when God directs us, and even when God calls us, and even when the Holy Spirit leads us somewhere, the path will not always be easy. The path will not always be easy, but hear this, God will prevail. God will prevail. And and church, God may lead us to do certain things for him, and and we look at what we're doing, and and we don't see the fruit right now, we don't see the results right now, and we wonder, man, why would God have me doing this thing? But the reality is it's not for us to question God's plans. It's really for us to live our lives in joyful obedience to him. But here's the thing. When we joyfully obey him, we get to see the fruit later, right? And by later, maybe it's on the other side of eternity. I don't know. But there's fruit as we respond in obedience to what God calls us to do. 
But I want to tell you, you can be sure of this, that when God directs you, there's a reason for his directing. Would you stand with me today as we prepare to close? Listen, I I truly believe this, that as a believer in Jesus Christ, it is a privilege to join with God in what he's doing. It's a privilege that we have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And as you live your life like that, you get to see some amazing results. Can I just say following Jesus is an amazing adventure. And so I just want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you, church, don't turn back. Don't turn back. Again, we don't know what John Mark was dealing with, but something in him said, I'm going back to Jerusalem. I had enough of this, right? But I got to say this clearly today. Our world, our nation needs some bold Christians. Need some people who will stand up for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who will speak the truth and speak the truth in love. And so maybe you're here today and you're tempted to turn back like John Mark when things get tough. But don't turn back because I believe God wants to use your life. Acts 13, this is just the beginning of the journey that's going to transform the world. But if you're a Christian here today, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are a slave of Christ, understand you're a part of that story today. You are a part today of the ongoing transformation of lives, and we could see that mission accomplished in our lifetime. And so let me say this, let God prepare you. Let God prepare you. As he prepares you, the Holy Spirit has a time for you to be sent out, wherever that is. Maybe it's to your workplace. Maybe it's across the globe. But let him prepare you, right? And when he calls you, step out and respond in obedience. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord God, we thank you today for, Lord God, the fact is that you are, Lord, victorious. And we thank you for this reminder from your word today that, when we speak the truth and when we stand up for the gospel, that there's going to be opposition. But we thank you today, Lord God, ultimately you're victorious. And so I pray for your church today, Lord God. I pray that you would make us bold, Lord God. Lord, I pray that we would not keep silent for a desire to be loved by the world. Lord God, we know that the world hated you. (laughs) And yet you spoke the truth. So I pray this week that as we go out of this place, you'd give us wisdom, you'd give us discernment, Lord God. Lord God, when to speak with gentleness and when to boldly confront sin that's before us, Lord, we never want to be silent, Lord God, about what you call sin. So use us this week, Lord God, use us this week, and Lord, we pray that the hand of the Lord would be upon our lives, Lord God, that you would bless us, that you would bless us. But Lord, I also pray that your hand would be upon us to convict us and to change us and to shape us to be more like you. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship him before we leave this place today. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory God is what our hearts long to be overcome by your presence. Lord, say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God is To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free, when my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord.
your presence so we sing I give myself away I give myself away so you can use me. give myself away I give myself away so you can use me here I am here I stand Lord my life is in your hands Lord I'm longing to see your desires revealed in me I give myself away Self away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. Take my heart, take my life as a God, we say yes this morning. Whatever your will is for our lives, God, no matter the cost, we may lose some things along the way, God, but we count it a joy, God. We count it a joy, Lord, to give our lives entirely over to your will, for your plan. God, to be your hands and feet in this generation to be your light in this dark, dark
dark place, God. Use us, God. I pray we would say yes. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. that's your prayer this morning that you say yes I, I was speaking to the choir earlier today and Pastor Dan said it in his sermon God doesn't need us but I think what's more amazing is that he wants us he wants us he, he wants that's how much he wants a relationship with us guys so badly that he says Chris I want you to be my hands Pastor Dan can you be my feet can you be a cup of cold water to this person that's thirsty can you give food to this person that's hungry would you visit this person who's imprisoned that's how much he wants a relationship with you this morning I don't know about you but that, that, that brings me joy joy unspeakable that the creator of heaven and earth wants a relationship with me and instead of just doing it on his own because he can he says no I'm going to allow all of us all of you guys me everyone on the stage to partake not just in church but in our schools in our communities at our workplaces in our families now I don't know about you but I'm excited of what's to come after this service because I know there are going to be testimonies that come out of this service today. Amen. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Hallelujah. Well, before you go, uh, uh, you know, don't, don't rush out of here. Say hi to someone. Love on someone. Hug on someone. And uh, we'll see you next Sunday. God bless you. We love you.